Hello and welcome to the Be Ready for the World Conference. I'm Becky from Cambridge University Press and I'll be hosting your webinar today. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr Liz Taylor, who will take you through this session on using metacognition to boost student achievement. Liz is an education consultant and lead trainer for Cambridge International. Before we start, I just wanted to go through a few points with you. You may have noticed your microphones are muted. They will stay on mute as we go through the session to avoid any background noise. Liz and I are also both hosting this webinar from home, so if there are any issues with our internet connections, please bear with us. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar, so do post any questions you'd like to ask in the Q&A box as we go through. You can also use the chat box for any general comments, but please don't post questions for Liz here as they may get lost in the chat. If you're having any technical difficulties with sound or video, please let us know in the chat and we'll do our best to resolve them. We recommend that you use headphones to listen to this session for the best sound quality. We are recording the webinar and we'll send you a link to the playlist following the conference, so don't worry if you miss anything. If you're unable to see the Q&A or the chat icons, please hover your mouse at the bottom or the top of the screen and they should appear. And now over to Liz. Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be able to be with you this morning. And isn't it such a privilege that we can gather together from all over the world in this way? So our theme this morning is metacognition and how we can use metacognition to boost our students' achievements. And these are our aims. Um, it will be a fairly basic introduction to metacognition. So I'm hoping it will be accessible to everybody, no matter whether you've heard anything about metacognition before. But if you're someone who's a little bit more experienced in this area, I will be suggesting some resources at the end where you can take things a little bit further. So we'll be thinking about how metacognition can be used in the classroom, its potential for boosting achievement. And also we'll be thinking about building a toolkit of strategies to support metacognition. So we'll be thinking about some practical things that we can do in the classroom with our primary and lower secondary students. So I hope there'll be at least a few strategies that are new to you, but also perhaps some ways that you can tweak things that you're already doing to get the most value out of those in terms of metacognition. So some of you who've been Cambridge teachers for a while might well be familiar with the Cambridge teacher standards. And the metacognition fits in really well to those. It actually fits with um, standard six, uh, which is all about innovative and effective classroom practice. And of course, as Cambridge teachers, we're always trying to develop our practice, to get better, to improve, to take on board new things so that we can give our students the best experience possible in terms of their learning. And metacognition fits in really well with things like active learning and assessment for learning. And I'll look at a few of those links a little bit later. And of course, we're also trying to develop this Cambridge learner. So our young people, we want them to be reflective. We want them to be evaluative, innovative and resilient in their work. And this is something that can help with that area of independent learning, which we're often trying to develop. So just to get ourselves started, what do we actually mean by metacognition? Now, if I asked you that question, I wonder what you would say. Just, just have a think for five seconds or so. I suspect that plenty of folk out there would say thinking about thinking. That tends to be the sort of immediate response to the question, that sort of quick and easy definition. And it's, it's okay, it's okay. So um, cognition is thinking, it's, it's all that sort of mental activity that is going on in our heads. And meta in this context means about. So it's thinking about thinking, or if you like, you can say learning about learning. So that's helpful as, as an initial definition, um, but it, I'm not sure how much it really helps us get to grips with classroom practice. You know, what, what does that actually mean for what I can do in the classroom? So this is perhaps a slightly more developed, a better definition for us to try and remember if we can. So it's the processes involved at these three stages when learners plan their learning, when they monitor it, 
and when they evaluate it and make changes to their learning behaviours. So if you notice there, there are almost three time phases. There's, there's thinking about the learning in advance, that planning stage. How am I going to tackle this task? What can I remember about some of the strategies that I've used in the past? Which of those might work here? There's the monitoring, that sort of checking as we're going through. Do I understand these words? Is, is this working? Is it going where I thought? And then there's the evaluating afterwards. How did I get on with that? Did I manage to achieve those aims? So there's those three stages. So if you remember nothing else from this morning's talk about metacognition, try and remember plan, monitor and evaluate as those three stages of metacognitive behaviours. So I thought that before we go much further, let, let's actually give this a try. Teachers tend to be expert learners, otherwise they wouldn't have got to where they are. Um, so you actually probably have very well developed metacognitive skills, even if you're not necessarily explicitly aware of those. So let's, let's try them out. So I'm going to do a little task with you. I'm going to show you part of a poem published over 100 years ago. Now, notice your feelings at this point. Some of you might be thinking, oh, that sounds good. Others of you thinking, oh, no, poetry. I haven't done that for years. Um, I'm going to ask you to write a one sentence summary. So this will only be fairly quick because we don't have much time. But if, if you've got a notebook or a scrap of paper nearby, that would be helpful. So before I actually show you the poem, I just want you to think how will you approach this task? What strategies will you use? So some of you might think, ah, oh, yes, I'll do this and I'll do that. Others of you, oh, perhaps poetry is a little bit more tricky. So just, just think for 10 seconds or so. Okay. So here's our poem. It's only part of it. Um, let me read it to you. Twas brillig, and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wade. All mimsy were the borrow groves and the mow wraths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome so foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. Now, I wonder what your reactions are to that poem so far. Some of you, I'm sure, will have recognised it and it's very familiar and you'll know how to approach it. Others of you might be thinking, oh, is there a whole load of English vocabulary I've been missing all my life here? To which the answer is no, do not worry. Um, I wonder if I show you the picture that illustrates it, perhaps that might help you make some more sense of the poem. So have a go, see if you can write a summary, a one sentence summary of what is happening. Let me just give you a few moments to, to think about that. It can be rough, just a few ideas are fine. One sentence summary. If you're feeling very brave, you can always put it in the chat um, so that others can see it. Now, I'm, I'm not an English literature teacher, I'm, I'm actually a geographer, but my one sentence summary, I think, as, as well as I can do, is a son goes to a strange place to hunt a dangerous monster. Um, so I wonder if you got something a little bit similar to that. Um, it's, it's only a sort of short fun activity so please don't worry about it at all but what I wanted to use it for is for us to think about the process that we went through. So let me give you some reflection questions. 
So I wonder how you planned to tackle that task. I suspect some of you, particularly if you are an English literature teacher, you, you will have a really big toolkit of learning strategies for dealing with poetry. And quite quickly, you might have started to recognise the genre um, and that would have helped you in decoding it. I wonder how you monitored your pro progress. Um, probably you were starting to think, ah, you know, I'm noticing that not all these words make sense. And in fact, of course, it's it's a nonsense poem. Um, you'll, have, you'll have realized that I'm, I'm sure this is um, a poem by Lewis Carroll um, and it's from Alice's um, Adventures Through the Looking Glass. So it is not designed to be completely decodable and to make sense. It's it's more that it meant it's meant to create an atmosphere. So you might have noticed which words actually are proper English words and make sense and which ones aren't. And then the ones that aren't, you'd be sort of thinking, hmm, but what, what's the sort of atmosphere being generated? What's the mood being generated? What, what sort of ideas come up there? And perhaps the, um, the picture would have helped with that. So you'd have been checking and monitoring and thinking about it. I wonder how effective your summary is looking back, so evaluating it afterwards. And I also wonder how motivated you were to complete this task. Possibly, as I say, you love poetry and you're really interested in nonsense. As well, which you can go, ah, fantastic, you know, I, I'm really interested in that. Others might have thought, hmm, not for me at all, not something that I feel confident in, not something I enjoy. And isn't that like our students in the classroom? And actually metacognition has an element of motivation, cross-cutting it and working with it. And I'll, I'll look at that in a minute. So this, this just little task took us through the stages of thinking about metacognition. We had planning, we had monitoring and checking, and then we had evaluating afterwards. So let's have a look at those stages in a little bit more detail. So there's the planning, how will I do this? There's the monitoring, the checking, and then the evaluation afterwards. And you'll see that I've also put two other big terms on this slide that sort of interact with metacognition. The first you might have come across is this idea of self-regulation. Um, there's a little bit of, of debate in the literature about how these terms interrelate, um, but I'm going to take self-regulation as a broader term, more of an umbrella term, if you like, that involves metacognition, thinking about learning, but also cognition, just the learning itself, the strategies we use when learning, in this case, decoding a poem. And also it involves that element of motivation. So it's all about, if you like that independent learner, a, a really good self-regulated learner is able to approach a new task with confidence. They have a toolkit of different strategies to use cognitive and metacognitive. They're able to reflect on those, change them if they go wrong and they have good motivation. And motivation sort of fits in here because obviously there's no point in having really good planning and checking and evaluating and learning skills if actually we're really negative about the learning and actually that closes down our learning because we're really worried about it or if we just can't really be bothered you know and we'd rather go off and do something else and that sometimes can be an issue concert so there's a sort of self-management element in that as well and of course, teachers generally are very, very good at this and they've learned to do it either they just picked it up uh, sort of over their lifetime of learning or perhaps you had a really good teacher who taught you to do some of these things. Um, but the issue with our students is that not all of them do learn to do these things just automatically, particularly those students who are more disadvantaged in our classrooms. Um, that's often the case. So there's a lot of value here from us explicitly teaching some of these skills of planning, checking, evaluating, so that our learners can consciously deploy those and get better at them. And part of this, of course, is this idea of metacognitive talk. You've already seen me modeling some of that. Um, and this talk can either be internal in, our, in our, our own minds, or it can be in pairs in the classroom or in larger groups, if you like, talking to each other, talking to the teacher. So these are some sorts of types of phrases we might hope to, to hear. So with planning, oh, I could use this, I could use that. How am I gonna tackle this? I know I'm gonna try this first and see how it works with monitoring, do I understand? I'm not sure I get that word, that's not working, let me try something different. And evaluating afterwards, how well did that 
go, did I achieve the aim? Was that what the teacher was looking for? Was mine similar to the example she showed me? How could I improve things? What would I do differently last time? So there's a lot of talk involved here. And of course that fits very well with our idea of active learning in terms of the communication aspect of learning, talking either um, with a more um, experienced peer or with, with ourselves even sometimes. And, and the good news is that for those of you who like myself, find me, myself standing in the kitchen in front of the fridge with the fridge door open saying to myself, why did I come here? Did I mean to get out something out of the fridge? What did I mean to get out of the fridge? Um, that's not actually that you're getting a little strange. It's that you are involved in metacognitive self-regulatory dialogue. Doesn't that sound better? So that can reassure ourselves a little bit. Okay, let's have a think then about the value of metacognition in the classroom. How, how can it actually boost students' achievement? Is there any research on that, that that shows us that it has value? Well, the good news is that yes, there is research um, and there does seem to be value. So let's have a look at some of those sources. Um, so this is um, from some of the Cambridge assessment resources. Um, metacognitive practices have been shown to improve achievement across a range of ages, cognitive abilities and learning domains, so different subjects. So that's a sort of summary statement there, but there is research evidence to show that really good teaching of metacognitive practices can benefit students' achievement. It can benefit learning and long term, it can even impact on results as well, if done well. That's always the catch with these things, if done well. Uh, a lot of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with um, Hattie's work in terms of visible learning. And so he's um, noted some studies that actually produce overall an effect size of 0.69. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with effect sizes. Um, it's basically a number that shows um, how much potential a particular strategy, if taught well, has to impact on students' achievement over time. And 0.4 is seen as the sort of baseline of just sort of standard teaching in terms of student development. Um, so 0.69 is quite nicely above that. So that research is showing that there is potential here, um, if implemented well, for these strategies to impact on students' achievement. And um, this is a similar finding from the Education Endowment Foundation. If that's not um, a body whose work you've used, I'd really recommend it to you. It's a UK charity that works to sort of um, to commission and to disseminate results of educational research and looking at demonstrating impact on learning within the classroom and evaluating different strategies. It's a really useful, very accessible website that brings together resources and uh, research from lots of different sources. And their um, sort of terms in, in the way of looking at impact here is months. So how many more months progress might children make than the sort of standard expected for their age? And for metacognitive strategies, um, it's plus seven months, which is again, a really good effect size and um, at relatively low cost. So if you haven't used the EEF toolkit, um, do have a look at that. I'm gonna give the reference a little bit later on. So it, there seems to be good evidence here from research that it can actually benefit students' um, achievement if, again, done well. It's no good us just saying, oh, yes, yes, I'm doing metacognition in my classroom. Uh, we need to actually find out exactly which strategies some of these research projects used, and that's very easily accessible from the EF website, and we need to implement them well and thoughtfully within our classroom. Otherwise, we, we can't necessarily expect that improvement. Um, another point that comes out from research in this area is that metacognition and um, teaching metacognitive strategies, so supporting students in planning, in monitoring, evaluating their learning, works best when it's embedded within really good subject teaching. 
So it's not something that necessarily will work as well within a, some sort of generalized thinking skills that's decontextualized. Um, it's, it's better to, to really go for good teaching in maths or science or English or geography or whatever it is you're teaching and to incorporate it within that. Um, so I'll, I'll just let you read this particular quote from the EEF research. This is a really useful research summary. Again, I'll give you the reference for that. So good subject teaching is the key to this and thinking about how to embed these strategies well. And I'll come back to some ideas for that later. Now, I'm aware that some folk perhaps listening to this might be thinking, yeah, but I teach quite young children. You know, the children I teach are sort of fours to sevens. Surely this is something, you know, this is about abstract thought, isn't it only relevant to older students? Well, actually the research here again is quite helpful. Um, and this is the EEF. So a common misconception is that metacognitions only developed effectively in older children. But actually, research shows us that children as young as three have been able to engage in these sorts of behaviours, um, such as setting themselves goals, checking their understanding. Of course, the words we use, the way we encourage that, the prompts we use will be different to those with older children. But actually, young children are able to do these things. I, th I think the only warning that comes through from the research is that when we're thinking about evaluation um, and when we're sort of assessing our own work, uh, younger children tend to be less reliable in that. They tend, if, if anything, to be rather over optimistic in, in their achievement and their performance. So that's worth just, just bearing in mind. Um, and of course, any self-report of learning or, always has issues with it. Um, but it's still something that we can be training them in those ways of thinking and changing behaviours. So let's get down to some of the, the practical details. Um, what can we actually do in our classrooms to embed some of these metacognitive strategies to get children thinking not only about the learning that they're doing, the sort of cognition, but also how they are doing that learning, what's working, what's not working. Well, the good news here is that there's probably lots of strategies you're already doing that can easily just have that little extra value added to them to really make them into metacognitive strategies and to bring out that metacognitive potential. So here's one to start us off. I'm sure this is familiar to many people, the KWL chart. Um, so K, what I know already, W, what I want to know, L, what I've learned. And there's lots of different ways you can use these. Um, you can use them as, as a little sheet that the children write on. Um, my personal favorite is to use sticky notes. Obviously these are assuming the children are writing at this stage um, and to get them to write what they know already about a new topic on sticky notes. We put them up on the wall and then what they want to know so getting them to ask questions about this topic is a lovely thing to do as a class and then um, also later on perhaps in the end of a lesson or the end of a short, short sequence to write what they've learned um, and if you do it with post-its the nice thing is that you can look at your questions which were under your W column and you can move them to the L column if they feel they've actually answered those questions so that that's rather nice. This is also a good strategy if you're working with slightly old children, perhaps upper primary, lower secondary. If you're wanting them to do some note taking and there's a bit of an issue in your class where children tend to copy and paste off the Internet or just write stuff down out of textbooks and you actually want them to tailor their note taking to questions. Um, it, this can be quite a nice way of structuring that note taking. So a KWL chart is, is, is common learning practice in our classrooms. Um, and it, it's very, very close to already being a metacognitive strategy because it gets them to reflect on what they know already. And of course, in terms of good teaching, that's activating prior learning, isn't it? It also has that diagnostic element for the teacher, which is really helpful. Um, and then later on, it's getting to evaluate and reflect back on their learning. So it's very, very easy to make a KWL chart into a metacognitive activity just by emphasizing a little bit that planning and that evaluation um, when you're talking to them about the activity and when you're reflecting on it. 
And it fits in really well with both active learning and assessment for learning. If you think about it, a KWL chart, when done well, fits in the sort of intersection, if you like, of that Venn diagram. So we can think about it as assessment for learning um, because the, there's feedback to the teacher on what the children knew already, what they've learned. And obviously the teacher can then adapt their teaching, that sort of feedback loop that we do within AFL. It's got that active learning element in it because it's activating the prior learning. It's making the children think hard, which is the, the key for active learning, isn't it? And then, of course, it's got this metacognitive element as well, because we're thinking about planning and evaluating learning. So we're hitting lots of really good learning strategies by using something like a KWL grid. It's something that I really like to use at the beginning of a new topic. Um, but of course, it's got lots of lots of different potential there. Um, other familiar strategies, modelling. Um, this is a great one, isn't it, for, for primary teachers in particular. They tend to be real experts in modelling. And what I'm meaning by that is helping students in the class access the thinking and language of an expert learner. So if you're perhaps learning with your class about a particular mathematical strategy or a particular um, way of writing in English, perhaps you're modelling a new way of opening a paragraph, then it's a matter of the teacher there with a board or with something on PowerPoint and just saying now, OK, I'm going to start it this way and I think I'm going to say these things. Oh, actually, no, maybe I need to change that because I'm just thinking that this. So it's opening up that sort of that dialogue that goes on in the head of an expert learner, but actually sharing it with your class, bringing them in. And of course, this can be also something that's very much done in, in practical subjects. So if you think of art or you think of sports, it's that demonstration, but not just showing them. It's also explaining what's going on in the head. So I'm deciding to use this brush for these reasons, or I'm deciding to use an underarm throw or an overarm throw for these reasons. So it's letting them in to that thinking process. So modelling works really, really well with encouraging metacognition. So just let's just take a quick check for a minute. I've got two diagrams there. One of those is cognition. One of them is metacognition. So one of them is, is about the sorts of things that go on in the classroom with learning. The other is about thinking about that learning. Which one would you say is which, I wonder? Just a quick check. There we go. So the top one is the cognition, everything that goes on in our minds when learning, thinking about music, thinking about science, thinking about geography, whatever it is we're doing. Um, then metacognition is the reflection on that. So just to say something about cognitive strategies, because these are important. So the majority of what we do in the classroom is, is cognitive, isn't it? It's thinking about learning a particular subject and different learning strategies. I'm sure some of these are very familiar to you. Um, so we, we use these a lot, don't we, in Cambridge learning and active learning, lots of different card sorts, values, lines, when we get, get in order, whether we agree with something, disagree with something. Silent debate is such a fun one to use. Um, even quite elaborate strategies like um, de Bono's thinking hats or some of these lovely um, Harvard Project Zero strategies like See, Think, Wonder or Think, Pair, Share. Now, those are all cognitive strategies. They're about learning a particular thing, but they can be very easily made into metacognitive strategies just by how well we debrief them. So when we debrief, which is one of the most skilled activities in teaching, isn't it? Do we actually focus not just on the learning, but on how we learned those things? Which strategy did we use? Did that work? Could we do something differently another time? How well did it work? Did we really get to grips with that or do we need to do something different? So debriefing draws out, if it's done well, the metacognitive dimension of cognitive activity. So those sort of reflection questions that we set our class can be really important. We can also encourage them to consciously think in the planning stage. So I'm going to show you in a minute, you might say in the classroom, I'm not going to do this, I might show you um, some new um, mathematical equations. I want you to think, how have you solved those in the past? What strategies have you got that you might use them? And then just get them to think through about that. So the questions that you ask them um, can very easily put the focus onto metacognition as well as cognition in the classroom.
Of course, sometimes we need to actually teach metacognitive strategies explicitly, but sometimes it's just a matter of tweaking the sorts of questions that we would ask. But of course, asking questions is not easy, is it? We know this as experienced teachers. So it's good, particularly if we've not really done much of this before, it's good to plan those questions in advance and actually have them jotted down in our notes so that we know um, how we're going to bring out that metacognitive dimension. So those are a few strategies. Um, if any of those cognitive strategies, by the way, were unfamiliar to you, um, do just Google them, or I'm very happy to take questions in chat about those. So that's a basic introduction to metacognition. Um, how can you take this further? And the good news is that some really helpful resources out there that you can use to develop your understanding of metacognition. So the first one, this is what I'd really recommend if this is a fairly new area to you. So I'm sure you've probably come across the Getting Started with Guides. These are so helpful on the Cambridge International website. Um, we'll also put the references, the web references for you in chat so that you can copy those if you want to. Um, so this is just a really nice online free resource that will take you through the basics of metacognition, give you some ideas. It's also got some further reading in it. It's got some nice little videos, very accessible. If that's already familiar, if a lot of what I've said today is relatively familiar and you want to actually get to grips with a little bit more advanced stuff and perhaps to look at some of the research in this area, then I'd recommend the education briefs. Again, some of you might be familiar with these, really helpful for school leaders in sort of getting up to date with some key ideas. Um, they've got a little bit more theory in they're slightly more academic in approach and again, have some good reading lists and they bring in some of the research. And then also, this is particularly helpful, I think, um, for both teachers and school leaders. There's a guidance report from the Education Endowment Foundation on metacognition and self-regulated learning. It brings together lots and lots of different research studies. It summarizes them really accessible. It's very readable. And it even has a sort of poster that you can print out and put in your um, staff room to sort of remind staff of some of the key points. Um, if all of that is relatively familiar, then the EF also have um, a research guidance brief, which has, it's a lot more academic and summarizes all of the different types of research in this area and talks about some of the issues with things like definition and comparing different approaches. Um, so we'll also put that in the chat. And if you're wanting something much more advanced, that can be helpful. And so there's some great resources out there. I, I hope that we've perhaps whetted your appetite and you want to go a little bit further with this. Um, so I thought just as we end, let's do a little bit of reflection on our own learning. Um, I'm sure you use exit passes in the classroom. I, I find these just so helpful. So let's just take 30 seconds. And if you've got that notepad there, just jot down for yourself now, what would you say metacognition is? Why is this important? And also, can you just identify one small step you would take to implement these ideas in your own teaching? Or if you're a school leader, it might be something now that you want to do, something that you want to read up on or something that you want to share with your own staff. So I'll just give you um, 30 seconds or so just to have a think and a reflect. You might even like to put your small step in, in chat so that other people can see that. So our aim in this short talk was to think about the basics of metacognition. I, I hope that um, that idea of planning and monitoring and evaluating has come over clearly to you. Um, we've thought very briefly about the evidence that shows us that metacognition, when taught well in the classroom, can boost students' learning, students' achievement, um, and you know, do, do follow up some of those sources. 
And we've also just very briefly thought about a toolkit of strategies that can help us in these areas and, and things we do already as teachers. So things like using strategies like the KWL um, grid and then just thinking about tweaking slightly in our debriefing in the sort of instructions that we use to bring out the metacognitive value there. Also things like modelling that effective teachers also do as part of their classroom practice has value in developing and just debriefing. So the normal cognitive strategies we're using, just bringing in that little extra value. Um, so I hope that that's been helpful for you as an introduction. Um, it's been a real privilege to, to share that with you today. Um, and, and I hope it's helpful in implementing that within your classroom. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liz. That was really interesting. And the chat has just been full of people saying how interesting and helpful they're finding this. And lots of people also um, putting in comments to say, oh, yes, I've used this technique. This is really helpful. So they're sort of offering advice to one another, um, the teachers within their own classrooms, which is really lovely to see. So that's really great. Um, we've had a lot of questions come in. Um, and actually, I think there are some uh, common themes. So I'm going to try and address as many as I can here. Um, I think um, the first one to to perhaps raise is of course given our the world that we're currently living in at the moment um quite a few teachers um abdul arif farah have asked about how we can achieve all of these brilliant strategies um to aid metacognition alongside remote teaching conditions mm -hmm. do you have any advice for how it's different does it become more important because we are separated by a screen what do you think liz Thank you. Yeah, that's it's a really good question, isn't it? And I, I do have so much sympathy for teachers at the moment adapting to these new ways of working, often in situations where children don't necessarily have the equipment that we might hope for. Um, and sometimes also trying to blend online learning with with classroom learning, which is enormously challenging because it almost means you're doing two jobs. So it's like, well done, teachers, I think I'd want to say to start with. Um, yeah, I, I think it's really good. I, I think as with active learning assessment for learning, um, the, these are just part of good teaching, aren't they? So whether we're doing that teaching online or whether we're doing it in person, these should be things that we're thinking about. And a lot of it adapts very easily because it's about the questions you're asking. So just asking children, you know, what, what strategy are you going to use with this maths? Or, and you can ask that orally if you're on a face-to-face -face Zoom like this, or you can just put it as a question if you're setting a worksheet or something that they're doing at home. Before you start this activity, just think, you've done long division before. Can you remember the two strategies I've taught you for long division? What were they? Which do you think is going to work this time? So that would be something on planning. And then also just encouraging them perhaps to work with a learning partner and you can set that up in Zoom and breakout rooms, can't you? Getting them to talk to someone else as they're doing their work. So that's so you get that sort of checking element going on. And then evaluation, again, evaluation questions always work really well, whether it's written reflection or whether it's verbal. And obviously, I, you know, I do appreciate that some children aren't going to be able to do written reflection, they're not writing yet. Um, so just getting them talking together as you would in the classroom. I think can work absolutely fine on, on Zoom as well or whatever platform you're using. Um, so yeah, very much I would encourage you to, to be thinking about these things online. And often it's small changes. Small changes can bring out a lot of that metacognitive aspect of learning. Thanks, Liz. Some really good tips there. Um, we've had some questions um, about the student role themselves within the metacognitive process. Um, a few teachers asking about how students can be encouraged to plan, to monitor, to evaluate themselves. Does it take time for learners, particularly young learners, to, to build the confidence and awareness to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think as with any type of learning, these things all have to be scaffolded in, don't they? And it's small steps over time, so not doing too much too quickly. So particularly with young learners, I mean, the, the lovely thing with young, young learners is that they often want to talk about things, they get excited by things, whether that's in the classroom or online. Um, and so just asking them good questions about their learning. So, you know, remember yesterday we did this, can, can you remember how, how well did that work? How, how well do you think we did that as a class? Can anyone remember someone's work that really illustrated that well? Or oh, let's look at that example together. Now, oh, you did this. How did you do that? Can you remember? So just talking about learning, um, I, I think exactly is all you need to do to start with. Um, having said that, I have seen some teachers with younger children do some really interesting things around sort of the types of learning behaviors they're using. They're not using those 
those words, obviously, um, but um, using pictures to show learning sort of how we're doing different types of learning and the sorts of skills that we're using so, so I, the, one of the primary schools I work with has a whole load of these different learning behaviors matched with different animals and the teacher will hold it up and say now we're going to use our whatever snake behavior it is um, I think it makes more sense to them than it does to me to be honest but they understand <laughs> it and that's the main thing it's a little bit like you can use De Bono's thinking hats with that you know saying to everybody in, in a younger children now let's all put on our yellow hat and that means we're going to think about it in this way doesn't it um, and, and so yeah the, there's all sorts you can do with, with younger children as well but with any age group it, it's slow steps isn't it the same as when you introduce active learning you don't do anything too much too quickly just bring it in slowly and actually modeling yourself as a learner is so important so you know you do, I, let me let me think about this now I remember I did two different types of approaches to this and actually when I did this last time the first one seemed more effective so I'm going to try that again so just showing them that that sort of provisionality of learning if you like um, modeling that in your own behavior and thinking and then they will start to pick that up um, so yeah, I, th I think slow, steady steps. Don't try to do too much too quickly. Mm, great, thank you, Liz. We had a couple of questions um, about the links or the relationship between metacognition and social emotional learning. A few teachers are using this SEL um, phrase in, in the question box. What is the relationship between those two, do you think, and, and how can they um, work well together? Yeah, so it's a good question, isn't it? And I think that's a little bit like the relationship with sort of motivation as well. Mm -hmm. So these things, of course, all work together um, and help each other. Um, and so we, we can think about learning as, as being, I guess, cognitive in, in terms of the sort of thinking about particular subjects. But we can also think about learning having that affective dimension, the sort of emotional Mm -hmm. um, dimension as well and I guess both of those would have a metacognitive element wouldn't they so thinking about how I did that is just as important in terms of learning science as it is about learning to be a good friend learning how to be kind to somebody learning how to work well in a group and we can reflect on that in just the same way we can sort of bring it if you like into conscious thought so yeah that's that's a good link to have made so so although I've very much been talking about cognitive aspect of learning of course this element of reflecting on how things happen would work just as well with a sort of effective emotional learning as well. Mm, it's an interesting link, isn't it? Particularly when thinking about younger learners and how those yeah, skills are built together. So. It's interesting. Um, there was a couple of questions about um, how to help parents to understand the process of metacognition. Yeah. Um, an interesting question, um, an interesting comment about um, the need to almost convince parents of the value of metacognition and the, the part that the student themselves has to play within this. Yeah. Do you have any advice for how to communicate the benefits of metacognition to parents? It's a, it's a really good question, isn't it? And, and of course, <laughs> in a way, the word metacognition doesn't help us necessarily <laughs> no. here. It, it obscures more than it reveals sometimes. Mm. Um, and of course, parents are a very, very diverse bunch, aren't they? You know, if you're working with really quite academic parents, then then actually the idea of metacognition might be familiar or really interesting to them. But actually, normally parents are a much more mixed bunch. So I, I wouldn't necessarily even use that term with them. I think it can be off putting. Um, but parents are very keen on the sort of idea of independent learners. You know, they want their children to grow up to become independent learners. And, and you can make links there with things like 21st century skills, with learning learning for life, you know, all of this sort of thing. So I think the basic idea of learners being conscious in their learning processes, of having lots of choices, toolkits, um, doing better in exams, hopefully is always a good thing as well. Um, but I, I might be a bit wary about using that term metacognition unless I was very sure that my parents would res respond well to that. So I, I think I might talk about the thing, but use it in different ways, sort of so, so learners who are really effective learners or independent learners. Um, I might want to go for instead. That's interesting. I hope that helps. Yeah, I'm sure it will with the parents being on board with this process and helping to support it. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, and I think I might end with Christine's question, which is a really practical one um, about how to make space and time for metacognitive practices 
within what can be very busy lessons, lots of content, lots of curriculum points to work through. Um, and so she's asking how long should be spent on this and how to how to work it in. Do you have any advice there? Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? So I, I think, of course, the majority of our teaching always and learning is going to be cognitive, isn't it? That, that's the point, you know, they're there to learn English or geography or whatever. Um, but I think often this is just a tiny little bit of added value that we can tweak. We, we would anyway be asking them questions. We would be doing debriefing we'd be setting up activities so it shouldn't take an awful lot more time to actually insert a few questions that are helping them to think explicitly about planning about monitoring and about evaluating of course there may be times that we want to actually take a little time out in our lesson and spend actually a quarter of an hour consciously teaching a metacognitive strategy and the reason for doing that would be that we would hope that it would then have benefits for their learning later so in a way we've got that tension a little bit like active learning sometimes people find that you know some of these strategies take longer uh, but we hope that actually the children are going to really internalize and remember the stuff more mm -hmm. and that it's going to have then a knock-on effect to achievement later so it's worth investing the time in um, but certainly to start with I would say all, all you need to do is just tweak these questions a little bit that you'd be doing anyway shouldn't take any extra time up that's really helpful thank you Liz I think unfortunately we're now out of time for today we really hope that you enjoyed the webinar thank you all so much for your questions and apologies if we didn't get around to answering yours thank you also to Liz for taking the time to be with us today as we said earlier we will be uploading a recording of the session to YouTube so you'll be able to revisit the webinar and share with your colleagues I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you again for joining us